to Two Trees in a Pod with Alyssa and Sam, where we talk about all things life and relationships and tie it all back to faith. I'm Alyssa. And I'm Sam. And today we are excited to discuss the struggle of being in your 20s as two 20-something-year-olds trying to figure out this thing called life. Let's get into it. All right, how about we start with a little warm-up conversation for this topic? Um... So, you know, your 20s are your quarter-life crisis, right? So I thought it would be super fun to warm up by sharing a little mini crisis we've both experienced thus far in our 20s. And I'm sure there are more to come. (laughs) But so I guess I'll share mine first. Um, Probably senior year of college when I was jobless after maybe 100 plus applications to jobs, Uh, many, many interview processes going to the final round, which is like five plus rounds of interviews, still not getting a job and having zero trust in God's plan for me, zero prayer life, again, zero job and absolutely no post-grad plans. I think I was such a difficult person to be around after volleyball season ended in November and then and it ended poorly. It ended with a loss, a very gut wrenching loss. And then I'm also getting rejected from the job I thought I was getting the same week. And I eventually solved this crisis, but it was like a pretty bad three week period of time. <laughs> and I think I'm kind of in not that same place now. I did have a gut wrenching volleyball loss in November again. <laughs> Um, and I'm still jobless. So other than that, I think my previous crisis with this prepared me for my current crisis with this. How about you, Sam? What was your, what's a mini crisis of your twenties? You're 25. So you've got five, five years experience in your twenties. I think it's a pretty similar crisis to most with the job crisis. I'm currently between jobs. I had a good job out of college. I worked there for two and a half years, but Moving up here to New Hampshire, couldn't continue on that path, so now I'm looking to go down a different path, and doesn't seem to matter where I apply or what I do, but the responses have all been the same, and that's okay, but it's definitely disheartening at times to not realize what's coming next or what that next plan is, and it's difficult to make long-term plans when we're not even sure where we'll live in six months from now, let alone work. So whether it's living or financial, there are a lot of unknowns up in the air and that definitely just makes it a little difficult to plan. So I think the struggle of being early mid twenties is you're not really sure what's next and that's okay, but it's just unknown. And everybody around you is constantly asking you what's next and it's all well intentioned and that's great that like we've got people who care about us and want to know our next steps but we don't really have any answers (laughs) and I think that can be a little stressful at times to just talk about when you're really you really have nothing to share (laughs) I feel like this is the same type of process for a lot of people when they experience going to college when they haven't picked a college graduating high school if they're not going to college it's all like what's your next step what's your next step and you don't know your next step so yeah I think continuing on the work topic that let's let's dive into the meat of the episode I think work is a huge topic in existential realizations of your 20s like wow I have to work for the rest of my life to just eat or to have a roof over my head and I really undervalued that as a child didn't I (laughs) Like, I think, Sam, you had that experience when you were a COVID workforce adult. Like, that was how you entered the workforce. And then they were like, come back to the office. And you were like, what? (laughs) Why why would I come back into the office when I just did every part of my job successfully for the last year? So fortunately, I do think that's a realization that a lot of people who have been in the workforce longer are realizing. And I think the workforce going forward is realizing that. But in reality, putting these things into effect and putting them into place, people do not like adapting to new things or adapting to change. So, you know, remote work's great, 
but it's also difficult to get everyone on the same page. There's disagreements on how things should be done. And it's just, do I have to hop between these different worlds for the next 40 years of my life? Am I supposed to do this eight to 10 hours a day, every single week, forever? I personally can't see myself doing that. A lot of people can see themselves doing that and want to see any other path to not do that. So it's, you know, it's difficult to see that as the path going forward, especially if it's a path that you don't want to take. Because don't forget, not only do you have to work eight to 10 hours a day for the rest of your life, five days a week, you also have to work out three to five times a week to maintain your physical health. Oh, and what about your family life? You need to make time to spend time with all the members of your family. Maybe you have a a typical family and you've got two sides of your family you need to see because of divorce or other life circumstances. That just doubles the amount of family you have, which is a blessing, but at the same time it is time consuming. And then you also have your social life. And then on top of all that, you need your spiritual life. You need time for personal and self-care and personal interests and hobbies. And Oh yeah, also you now cook all your own meals because you don't have a meal plan at college or you're not living at home anymore. And in addition to that, you need to find a side hustle because you gotta have your money work for you, right? So it's just, wow, I'm like getting a little stressed out talking about that. I'm sorry if anybody listening is too. (laughs) And you need eight hours of sleep on top of it so you can go through all that without feeling too exhausted. Yes, go to bed before 10.30, wake up at an early hour, and yeah, and then your life's perfect, right? And you won't be tired at all. Also, don't overconsume caffeine, don't drink too much, but drink enough, but like, it's just, you, it's just so much. I'm almost losing my train of thought with just the weight of how much all that is, and also, not only is all of this chaotic i didn't realize until like the past three years just how much it costs to be alive (laughs) like food like going to the grocery store i think we're getting better with it because we would go to the grocery store like literally every day and we still kind of do but we're big food people and cooking people so we definitely spend a lot of money on going out to eat and groceries and i it just It adds up. It adds up. And also rent is now something you have to consider, especially if you've moved out and then there's student loans and that's its own crisis. (laughs) Student loan monthly payments, those are astronomically high. (laughs) And then all the, like, we're talking about social life, we're talking about family life, that might involve travel, that might involve a plane ride, that might involve driving, which is gas and tolls and, oh, you need to buy a car and... (laughs) We're, we're getting off on like a, wow, this is like a lot tangent, and this is probably stressing out. I and that's the bare like, minimum to survive. <laughs> I think we've made our point on <laughs> how crazy your 20s might be. And then aside from all that, some other existential problems one might face in their 20s is transitioning out of the high school and college atmosphere into an adult life because you have set social time and set activities in college and in high school, especially with college. It's like a community where everybody lives together. Like Sam, you miss seeing, like you used to live next to all your friends. Yeah, it was walking distance from all the people that you'd want to hang out to talk with everything. They were literally 20 feet away at all times. At 2 PM on a Monday. I want to go see my boys. I'm just going to go walk over. <laughs> it's so easy. But then in adult life and beyond college, because you are an adult in college, but after college or after high school, people move away because not everyone's in your hometown anymore. If it's just high school or if it's college, not everybody's living in this isolated community environment and people move away. And we don't even live that far from our friends, but it is still so difficult to see people because it's a two hour drive. And we're like, okay, It's not just a little one hour hangout anymore. Now it's an entire day because we have to plan to drive down there, stay there for long enough to make it feel worth the drive and then drive two hours back and then boom, whole day gone. It's just not as convenient as it was. And you really have to be intentional with like social time. And then it's on top of all that other stuff we've already mentioned, right? 
So and there's another question, Sam, I don't know if you relate to this existential question, but in my notes I have, have I peaked? <laughs> like, is this the best it's getting? You hear like, oh, like, really treasure high school, it's great. And then you hear college, like, oh, these are the best four years of your life. And that's exciting while you're there. But then when it's over, it's like, was that it? <laughs> I think those peaked kind of questions, they really come with where your mindset is at the time. If you just get out of college and now the only thing you see in your future is working 40 hours a week for the next 40 years, it's going to be really easy to say, oh, I've peaked because I've now peaked. <laughs> I am going to live Groundhog's Day every single day for every week for the next 40 years. I think it's really easy to say, oh, I've peaked when you don't have a plan going forward. That being said, I think it's really easy to say, oh, I definitely haven't peaked. There's so many more th things to come. There's so much I'm looking forward to. If you have those plans in place or you're taking actionable steps towards your goals. Hmm. So I think you can fluctuate in and out of the have I peaked kind of discussion because if you really don't have anything you're looking forward to, well, then in your mind, the best has already come. But, you know, we're looking forward to our wedding. We're looking forward to kids. So it's easy for me to say, oh, I haven't peaked. There's all these things coming. There's definitely some aspects that I can say I peaked in. Like, I definitely peaked athletically. Oh, I, you know, I can probably <laughs> I think say we that, both too. Did. <laughs> um, I think I peaked in an academic sense. Like, no way am I ever going to be spending that much time expanding my, quote, knowledge, unquote. Like, I was in college and in high school, or I've probably peaked socially too, which I think anybody who went to college or high school with me is probably laughing because I was not the most social, but I guess with team activities and stuff, like I'm always around people. And now like I see the 40 people in my MBA cohort and I see Sam and Gravy. I could do without seeing Gravy, our cat, but <laughs> I do see him, but there are other ways that we haven't peaked yet. And like, we've definitely not peaked financially. <laughs> That's for sure. And we probably won't for a little bit. Um, <laughs> hopefully, fingers crossed. Hopefully That's in the we future. haven't peaked. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you hear college is the best four years of your life. And then people who didn't go to college are like, um, what about me? Or you did go to college and you're like, great what about the next 60 plus years of my life, give or take? Like, that was the best it gets. So I think that's a pretty common existential realization, especially with, like, everybody moving away. That's so hard because I miss the people that I saw every day at college so much. It hurts. And you can talk to them over text. And you can talk to them on Snapchat or see updates about their life on Instagram, what have you, but there's nothing that compares to seeing them every day. And I know you feel the same about your close friends from college. Yeah, having people right next door, it's even better than neighbors. It's people you hang out with all the time and their schedule's always free because all they have is a couple classes. It's such a fake time of life because you have so much free time. <laughs> even as student athletes, we still had so much free time and Wow. But I think another existential realization of your 20s might be the am I doing this life thing right? And that kind of falls into comparison. Like, am I grown up enough? Am I saving enough money compared to so-and-so? Am I being social enough? This person is going on European vacations every summer and I still can't afford my rent. And like... <laughs> Or I haven't even moved out from home yet. Like, these are very common thoughts to think. Because, obviously, the two of us, we hardly ever travel. I travel for volleyball all the time. That's paid for, not by me. And has come to an end. And we've gone on one vacation together as a couple. And we've been together for four and a half years. <laughs> but then, like, you open social media and you see... Like, people are always in foreign countries, they're always in Florida, always in California, like, always doing these really cool things. And I'm like, wow, am I not, am I doing something wrong? Like, how, how are they affording this? But all my friends are doing this and that. And uh, I'm sure people might feel that way, like, about, like, we're a little separate 
part of our 20s too because we're both oh you're mid 20s old guy over there but I'm early 20s and we're engaged and I think we have we've got one sweet pair of friends who are married and we've got and they're older slash same age as Sam and we've got one sweet pair of friends who are engaged but we definitely have a lot more friends than the four of them who are not (laughs) experiencing that in life right now and that can kind of be a little separation in terms of there's not really anything different but it's just definitely like no one wants to talk about wedding planning with me (laughs) you know so I think we isolated ourselves in that regard but I'm really excited for when our friends do go down that path because oh my gosh it's just so much fun but on the topic of comparison something that is extremely prevalent in our 20s is social media use and you know all that comparison that comes with knowing everything about everybody's lives 100% of the time, 24-7. So Sam, do you want to talk about FOMO and the trap of comparison? Because you don't even experience this, but you've seen me go through like the traps of comparison, which is why I literally always have Instagram deleted. But anyways, take it away. For FOMO in itself, I, I've never really struggled with you know, I've always enjoyed what I do on my own time. Uh, I've always had my little hobbies and my friends have their hobbies. So, I mean, if my friends were all deeply involved in social media and they noticed that I didn't like any of their posts or I wasn't responding to all their stories, I know that some friend groups would think I'm a terrible friend and that I'm not paying attention. I know that everyone in my friend groups is like, oh yeah, Sam just doesn't use Instagram. Mm -hmm. Sam's just not on Snapchat. So I think when you're deeply ingrained in these social media circles instead of just social circles, you're so ingrained in having to be so involved in everyone else's life. And it's not even that you don't care or that I really care about my friend's life. When I see them in person, I catch up and I get all the details. But I think there's sort of a piece to not knowing every single aspect of every person's life because you don't even know every aspect of your own life. You're still trying to figure all these own things out. And how can you possibly manage your own decisions, your own day-to-day, if you have everybody's decisions and everybody's day-to-day weighing on your mind 24-7? So that's not trying to take away from your relationship with your friends or being close to them. Because I still feel plenty close with a lot of my friends, even if we don't have too much in common right now. But I also don't spend my day scrolling through all of their lives, trying to know what they're all up to. So it's definitely a different kind of friendship. But as someone who was on social media throughout college, I think it's a much healthier friendship. I might only talk to them once a week, once a month. It's more meaningful, though. Yeah, because I'm not just, oh, I liked your post. Okay, well, I've acknowledged your existence today. It's a, (laughs) oh, hey, let's go get a meal this weekend. Let's hang out. Let's talk. And it's just, it feels more authentic. It just feels real. I do sometimes feel like, oh, I don't need to reach out to so-and-so because I already know what's going on in their life when, number one, I probably only know a very, very tiny fragment of what's going on in their life because that's what they shared on social media that day. And two, like, you still need to see people or text people or FaceTime people. And I think I definitely fall into that trap of like the convenience of social media. And I've been off all social media except for Facebook for business purposes, but um, for 2024 so far. And of course I post on two trees in a pod on our Instagram from your phone though, not from mine, but I don't see like my personal social media. And I feel like it's, I do social media fasts literally all the time because I'm so addicted to it that I just have to go cold turkey. Like, I don't even have Snapchat now because it got so bad to where I was watching. This is, like, humiliating to admit that I was watching, like, Snapchat Spotlight, which is so horrible and unfunny, but I was deprived from Reels and from YouTube Shorts and from TikTok, so I had to resort to Snapchat Spotlight, so now the app's just not on my phone. So if you've Snapchatted me lately and I've ignored you, I just don't have the app because I have no (laughs) self-control. But anyways, I digress. Social media has so many benefits, but it really does create this FOMO 
like never before, like never experienced in any other time in our culture because everything is public. Everything is just posted. Oh, there's a party. It's posted, posted, posted. Friendsgiving posted. Oh, I didn't get invited. Now I'm sad. But in reality, if you didn't have social media, you wouldn't have even known that that happened. And you probably weren't even meant to know that that happened because it's just, it's just life, you know? And it creates a lot of positive feelings, but also it can create the space for a lot of negative ones like FOMO and the feeling like you're not good enough as than somebody else is because of where they're at in their life or at least where they want to show they're at in their life which might be very different from behind the scenes i think we all are aware of how you can make things look on social media and how things actually can be i think i personally have been a person who's posted super happy pictures while not going through the best time in life we're like look at me here yay i'm having a great time here and like behind the scenes like the event that i was at was terrible i had a horrible time and like i just got one good photo and had to like adjust the lighting to it and everything to just even make it worth sharing like there's so much behind each photo that you don't see from a post so it's not worth all the FOMO that comes with it or all the negative feelings or the comparison. Or I know like years ago I had to unfollow all the models and all like the influencers because I was like, wow, why don't I have a size zero waist? And they're like, oh, I'm six foot two and <laughs> an athlete. So that will just, I would be hospitalized if I had a size zero waist, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, but anyways, in addition to social media, I think it kind of can really exacerbate the, I think I just stuttered that word, but you guys know what I mean. Also, I'm sick, so that's why my voice is a little scratchy and mysterious, so I'm sipping on a hot tea right now. But being in a different place from your friends, and I think, I don't know if this is relatable to anybody else out there, but Sam and I both have kind of not super been into the party culture thing, for a little bit now. Sam, you were a chronic party boy in college. And then I met you. And then you met me. And then all we wanted to do was just stay in. But (laughs) you still partied after we met. You, like, dragged me out. I didn't really party. (laughs) We have different definitions of parties. Well, you didn't hit the club. I never hit the club. (laughs) Yeah, you... Funny story. Sam, finally... He never had a um, means to get into a club before turning 21. Um... So when he was finally 21 and we were together, he wanted to go to the campus bar. And I think you were there for under 10 minutes before you called me and were like, come pick me up. Yeah, it was about five minutes. You were there for five minutes. I had dropped you off already, got back to campus and you were like, come pick me up. I don't know what to do here. (laughs) So I think that's just painting the picture of the we're not super into the party culture thing, which is a big part of being in your 20s is living in the city or having that party life or even smaller social events with your friends. It often revolves a lot around alcohol. And we're not cold turkey on alcohol or anti-alcohol or anything. I think we were for like a six month period of time, but we're kind of easing back into like a balance. Like we had a glass of champagne to celebrate the holidays being over the other day. <laughs> and that's not something we would have done within the past six months, eight months, because we were kind of taking a little break from it. But it's kind of tough when you do have these friend circles and they are on different paths from you. And we can't be alone in experiencing this, like being in a different place from your friends. Like we said earlier, we only have two couple friends who are engaged slash slash married. And yes, this is our own fault for being engaged in our early 20s. But it is a little tough because you don't really understand like wedding planning or all that stuff until you're doing it. Like, I know I thought I knew a whole lot about it. I thought I was a master on it because I was on the Reddit wedding planning page um, until I actually started actively doing it and yeah I don't know if you have anything to say on this Sam it's just kind of a different mindset some people 
you know, and no fault of their own, what they're looking forward to is they've worked a long 40-hour week. Okay, time to relax on the weekend. Let's go into the city. Let's go do this. That's just, well, right now I'm unemployed, so I don't have a long week to relax from. It's not, <laughs> Or $200 yeah, to spend at the bar. <laughs> exactly. So it's, you know, everyone has different things that they enjoy doing. You know, a lot of my friends, they might want to go to the bars. I would much rather be playing poker. I would much rather, you know, go do something else. Watch a show. Like There's just personal preferences to doing stuff. And just because that doesn't necessarily align with what it, the friend group it used to align with, doesn't mean you're not so close with your friends. It just means you're not really enjoying the same activities. So it can be isolating at times, but also realizing that your life is not like anybody else's. You're your own person with your own experiences. Just because some things are similar doesn't mean, you know, what you're doing needs to be similar. Right. And we're also in this, like, in between phase, I think, between that like bar scene and between the married with kids, like the two extremes, like we don't want to go out to the club and we are definitely not in the position to buy a house and start a family. Like that's years away. And I also feel years away from the bar club scene because I don't know what's appealing to everyone about standing in a club sweaty for <laughs> hours spending money i would rather if i'm drinking i would rather sit at like somebody's house and like play some games you know like <laughs> or like have a little girl's night in with like a wine glass and watch a movie but i don't know um so we are in this little like in between phase and it's kind of sweet because it's brought us closer together because we get it but like not that nobody gets us yeah no one gets us but <laughs> Um, it is definitely a little unique and there's other people out there who feel this way in other phases of their life. Like we've got friends who are in like a preparation period for grad school applications and they might feel a little isolated in that because everybody else is in the workforce and they might not be making the kind of money that they want to be making right now because they're doing this little in between and experience gathering for grad school. And that can feel a little isolating, I'm sure. And I don't know if you've got any other examples of this, Sam, because I, I guess no one really can relate to the whole engaged struggle right now. <laughs> yeah, it's so what I spend the majority of my free time on is my own personal business, a, a literal company that it is, you know, I don't have very many people in that same kind of circle of entrepreneurial doing your own thing. And that's okay. But it definitely, you rewire your brain to, a, okay, other people are definitely not thinking the same way I am. They're not doing, you know, they're just on a different page. And that's okay. And maybe they are, but they also think that everybody else is on this it, different page and they don't want to share because everybody else is on the different page. Exactly. I've always been a really open person, so people talk to me pretty freely. In you a are lot a of chronically open book. I, I don't really... <laughs> <laughs> people's opinion of me hasn't really changed how I've acted or responded. I've just always been myself the, <laughs> for both good and bad. Some might say unapologetically you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think that kind of pivots into, you know, we are in a time of uncertainty. We're in these early mid twenties and in the early to mid twenties, the, statistically aged 18 to 25 we have the lowest religious involvement of any age group which is funny because you know we titled the section pivoting the uncertainty to god in a time in our life where it is the most uncertain and we are the most unsure of what we're doing with our future we decide to take it all in ourselves and not hand over these uncertainties to God, who's already solved the problems. So a lot of people at our age, they're anxious, they're stressed, and they don't know where to go. And unfortunately, that does lead to the club. That leads to all these different directions. Mm -hmm. That leads to basically any way but to God. So it's a really confusing time when you have, you know, the youth of your 20s, all this energy. You're finally getting a job. You have all this money but you don't really have a direction that you're trying to go to. You don't know what your next steps are because are you working the next 40 years, 
50, 60? What are you doing for the rest of your life? You can't even plan for this weekend, like next weekend. And you're trying to plan for your next 40 years, next 60 years at the same time. Right? Like Exactly. It's so uncertain and confusing. And we talk about being in this weird in-between space. And that's confusing because we feel isolated and we can't feel like there's no way we're alone and feeling isolated in our 20s because of whatever phase in life we're at because all of you have your own individual circumstances and individual phases that you're going through right now and yeah there's other people out there going through the same thing but it's unlikely that it's the majority of your friend group right and since there's so much uncertainty in our 20s and unfortunately it is the lowest range of uh, development where people are attending religious services what better time than to pivot it all to god because guess what he has already solved all of it all of the problems that you are stressing over that you're pulling your hair out over that you're losing sleep over it's a waste of time because god has already solved it god has already solved it and i might be a little hypocritical if we're preaching on this because i love worrying about the future (laughs) i love thinking i'm in control of it i think i said in an earlier episode i am a professional control freak and i know it is so hard to let go of control today in today when we're recording is sunday and we went to church today and the pastor had a really good uh, comparison to what giving all this to God would look like and surrendering your life to God. He kind of compared it to writing a check. And are you just holding on to the checkbook and being like, okay, God, when when you need me, like, I'll, I'll write one. Like when you, when you open a door for me, I'll, I'll write it out in the specific amount that you ask for whatever but truly trusting god is writing filling out the check and leaving it blank and just handing it to him right and this is not a way for the church to scam you out of money this is just a comparison to trusting god um but like there were no checks being thrown at the pastor today but (laughs) but it was just kind of like a metaphor of surrender and i think it's important to remember that nothing is impossible for God. He has already accomplished the impossible. He has risen people from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. He has moved mountains. He has cured disease. He has parted the Red Sea twice. I think maybe another time. I don't know. I'll have to touch up on my Old Testament history. But I think a really beautiful place to turn to in the Bible if you are interested in kind of seeing your emotions reflected through faith would be Psalms because that's where we can go to in the Bible when we just need to feel, you know? Like it's the it's the emo part of the Bible. <laughs> like I need to feel right now. So I'm going to open Psalms and that's in the Old Testament. And we have just two that we thought it might be nice to share. And we've got first Psalm 9, 7 through 10. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Do you have any thoughts on that verse, Sam? It's just, it doesn't really need any, but... Yeah, I mean, it it explains itself. He, the Lord reigns forever, so he's the ref. He's your refuge. He's everyone's refuge. When you feel, you know, discomfort, when you feel anxious, when you feel uncertain, you can go back to him. You turn it over to him. So, in your twenties specifically, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much lack of direction. Well, there is a direction, and it's very clear. You just direction is up. You, you just don't know it yet. The The direction and path that you need to and will take is obvious. You just don't know what it is, and that's okay. It's okay that your direction is already laid out and to not know what it is. 
the hardest part is accepting that that direction is already laid out and just being okay with that and not letting the day-to-day worries, you know, weigh too heavily on you because you can always turn to him and know it will be okay and it'll be fine. Amen to that. And I think our final verse that we wanted to share is Psalm 27, 27, not 27. So Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And to that, I kind of think like trusting in chariots and horses, trusting in like a figure greater than yourself. Chariots and horses were like a representation of like the military back when this was written. And some trust in, I think this is a whole other conversation, but like politics and all that, that can also be another stressor of your 20s because you feel like the world is just slipping through your fingers and it's a heavy weight watching all the pain in the world and all the suffering in the world because of the news or because of social media virtue signaling and all that just head noise. Some trust in all that. And if you trust in all that, you will definitely feel the negative side effects of trusting in a president, trusting in any type of politician, trusting in anything you see on social media or the news because (laughs) it's chaos. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in Jesus and we trust in God and we trust in what he has done and what he continues to do. And I think there's no better verse for our 20s. Amen. Amen. So in closing, being in your 20s comes with so many preconceived notions, expectations, and false realities that can just be anxiety producing. You're transitioning from childhood to true adulthood, and this is a bit of a wake-up call for most of us as we are quickly thrown into big kid world. The quarter-life crisis is real. Not only are we experiencing all of these existential realities internally, but externally we can feel out of pace with our friends who are moving at different speeds in life, causing us to feel left behind or out of touch with the people we love so much. Understanding the difficulties and knowing that we are not alone in these feelings can make this whole process a little bit better. Turning to God also makes this whole thing easier because you know what? He has a plan for all of our anxieties and uncertainties, and we just have to turn to him and ask him. So next week, please tune in on Tuesday and listen to our thoughts on the locus of control and how that might be holding you back. Thank you for listening. God bless and see you next Tuesday.